nonsense and one of these days I'll tell you the correct political spectrum but before that I have to do what I've been assigned to do and that is should we privatize roads and highways and what I'll do is make two cases in the affirmative one on morality or ethics and the other on economics uh, on the moral case I noticed there's this young lady here with a nice backpack. What's your name? Oh, my name's Melissa. Melissa. I like that backpack. I really yearn for that backpack, and I want that backpack. And there are two ways, and only two ways that I can get that backpack. And there's a gigantic difference between the two ways. One is the voluntary way, and the other is the coercive way. Well, what's the voluntary way? I can say, I'll give you a hundred bucks for it, and the contents of it. Or, <laughs> Shut up, I was going to raise. <laughs> See, she's not in economics. She should have, uh... <laughs> or I could say, I'll be your best friend forever, or any voluntary thing. And if she says no, she doesn't want to be my best friend, and she doesn't want to take whatever money because it's precious to her, well, I just can't get it. The other way is I go up to her with a gun and I say, give it to me or I'll plug you. Or I get the rest of you guys to say, yeah, it's a great idea for Block to have it. Melissa doesn't really need it. Block needs it more. For whatever reason, I'm a demagogue. I convince you we have an election. You all vote to give, her, give me her backpack. And then she has to because if she doesn't, we'll put her in jail because it's a democracy. So there are only two ways to do it. Well, the first way, the voluntary way, is the market way. Everything in the market is voluntary. You guys are all wearing shirts and pants and wristwatches. All that stuff you got through the market. You seduced them into giving it to you by giving them an offer that they regarded as appropriate, namely the price. That's what the market is. It's the concatenation of all voluntary acts in the economy. And we can even go further and say that friendship, too, is part of the market if you want to go in that direction. In contrast, there's the political field. And in the political field, um, it's coercive. We vote, and then uh, the majority wins. And, and you, you just it's not a voluntary way of doing it. So it seems to me that it's much more ethically sound that I get that backpack with her permission than by steamrolling over her either by myself with a gun or all of us together with guns. Well, when we have things that are private, like pizza and hot dogs and wristwatches and pens and ties, that's the voluntary sector. When we have things through government, it's coercive. Now, you might say it's necessary, it's a necessary evil, but it's an evil because it's coercive. And according to at least the libertarian doctrine, coercion is per se uh, problematic. Uh, how do we finance public things? Well, we say everyone's got to chip in. Whether you like it or not, you have to chip in. And it's not voluntary. We didn't agree to be... The U.S. government isn't really like a club where we agree to. It's not really like a golf club. If you don't pay, you can't be in the golf club. If you don't pay your dues in the chess club, you can't be in the chess club. It's not like that because nobody signed anything. Okay, they signed the Declaration of Independence and John Hancock wrote big, but they, none of us signed anything. Look, if I said one of you owed me 100 bucks and I went to a judge and uh, they'd ask for some proof, they'd ask for some evidence. There's no evidence that we join any club. It's not a voluntary club. It's a coercive club. And don't tell me that democracy is great. Hitler came to power as a result of a democracy QED. So much for democracy. Democracy doesn't justify anything. It just says a majority agree. Well, a majority can agree to a lot of stuff. That's pretty grim. So I'm trying to say that there's a case for privatization. My motto is, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Since everything either moves or doesn't move, you privatize everything. That would be the extreme case. I don't know that I'll get to cover everything, but I'm certainly going to take a hack at highways. I don't think I'll do too much on post offices. That's sort of like shooting fish in a barrel. It's not really uh, you know, uh, a challenge. I mean, sure, we should privatize the post office. Uh, the present post office is a monopoly. If they do a lousy job, you know, the, they don't go broke. Um, you know, I, I'm from New Orleans, and uh, we had uh, Katrina in the aftermath, and about 1,500 people died in uh, Katrina. 
fact, didn't bother me that much. Although I don't like 1,500 people being killed needlessly. But what really bothered me is that the people responsible for it are still in business. I'm now moving toward the economics of it or the efficiency. They're still in business. That's horrible. Look, if uh, the people made these pens or this watch or pizza or whatever did a bad job, they'd go broke or they'd lose money and that would give them a hint to shape up and fly right. And if they didn't, they'd go broke. That's why we don't have a pen crisis or a pizza crisis or a, a shoe crisis or a wristwatch crisis or any of those crises because there's an automatic weeding out mechanism that if in the market you don't do a good job, Somebody is going to undercut you or undersell you. And, you know, where is a Pan Am nowadays? Where are the Fortune 500 of 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? They didn't do a good job. They're gone. The problem with a government enterprise is no matter how bad they do a job, you get more money. That's the result. Uh, they, they don't go broke automatically. There's no automatic feedback mechanism. Also, prices are very important. Um, we can't really have much of an economy as the Soviets found to their dismay uh, if you don't have free prices, market prices. Market prices tell you things. They give information as to scarcities and desires. And you know, one way to see things clearly is to extrapolate or infer. In other words, if we, have, uh, we put this in the public sector and we put that in the public sector, we put everything in the public sector, and now there are no markets whatsoever. Well, now, how do you determine prices? Well, prices are to the economy as street signs are to the geography. If you don't have them, you can't plan. You can't plan your way out of a paper bag. The Soviets had great chess grandmasters, and they could put their efforts together for Sputnik, but they couldn't plan their way out of a paper bag. They, they had a, a horrible economy. So prices are important. They give information. They allow us to make rational decisions. The Soviets had no idea as to whether to use, uh, if they want to make rowboats, should they be made out of uh, plastic, wood, uh, tungsten, platinum. Uh, without prices indicating scarcities, you're in a, a morass economically. Okay, so that's sort of the general case for privatization on the grounds of morality, on, on the grounds of economics. You can't have efficiency or morality in the public sector, or to the extent that you have a public sector, your morality and your efficiency plummets. Okay, now let me apply this to roads. Why am I so hopped up about highways, roads, streets, avenues, thoroughfares, things like that? Why should that be privatized? And by privatized, I don't mean this sort of wussy uh, privatization we were discussing uh, before, where you know the government sort of determines things and they have eminent domain, and, and, and then uh, you sort of have a quasi-demi, semi-private uh, road, but you have to give it to the government in 10 or 20 years. I mean, privatized roads as much as uh, t-shirts are now privatized. Or as much as sneakers are privatized or as basketballs are now privatized. Get the government out. Why am I so hopped up about that? Not because I'm hopped up about everything, but I'm... Well, I am hopped up about everything, but I'm more hopped up about this. Why? One reason is that... Do you know how many people die on the highways every year? It's about 40,000 people die in the U.S. Sometimes it's 39,000, sometimes it's 41,000, but by and large it's around 40,000. It's been reduced in uh, deaths per mile traveled, but because we're traveling more miles, but the death rate is still at around 40,000. To just put this in perspective, I think only 3,000 people died in 9-11. I think only 1,500 people died in... New Orleans, I think uh, only, what is it, 4,000 soldiers now in Iraq? This is 40,000. Mothers, grandmothers, babies, people, ordinary people walking around getting smushed by, you know, like nothing. Now, the usual answer that people will say, well, you know, what's this got to do with anything? The usual answer that they give is that it's not the cause of government. It's the cause of uh, speed, or alcohol, or vehicle malfunction, or driver error. The, uh, the Chicago types 
Sam Peltzman. I'm not a big fan of Chicago, even though they're supposedly free enterprise. They're sort of semi-free enterprise. Uh, Sam Peltzman, a Chicagoite, lists about 25 of these reasons. Uh, all sorts of weird things. I mean, these are the big four, the so-called explanations. These are the big four. Other things like, well, how fast is the uh, ambulance, or is there a helicopter ambulance? Uh, how good is the hospital? Uh, things like that. The NHTSA. NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, lists 125 causes of accidents. In my view, this is just proximate causes. They're not ultimate causes. What's the difference between a proximate and ultimate cause? If I take this gun here and I shoot over here with a heavy rifle and I kill somebody over there, and then you all capture me and want to put me in jail, I say, tut tut, not so fast. It was the bullet that did it. I didn't do it. It's 200 yards away. I'm innocent. You would never in a million years uh, allow me to get away with that sort of an excuse because I'd be confusing an ultimate cause, namely me, with the proximate cause, the bullet that hit the guy. Look, suppose a restaurant failed and we start making lists as to why the restaurant failed. And one is lousy food and another is poor service and another is... Uh, Location, location, location. Another one is dirty, whatever, dirty dishes, dirty floors. Would we accept that? No, not in a million years. What we'd say is those are the proximate causes. What's the ultimate cause? What's the real cause of the restaurant going broke? It's not those things, it's rather the management. The management didn't get a good cook. The manager didn't get good waitresses. The management didn't locate in the proper place. The management didn't get some guy with a broom and tell him to go sweep or have dishwashing good. It's the management. Well, who's the manager here? It's the bloody government who's the manager. It's the government that has not done well with regard to speed. It's the government that hasn't done well with regard to uh, reducing alcohol drunken drivers. It's the government that is responsible for all of these things. Those are just proximate causes. The ultimate cause is government management. Now let's get back to something I said before. What I said before was I talked about the weeding out process. The weeding out process would mean, in this case, if different people own different roads, the U.S. Highway 40 was owned by the U.S. Highway 40 Corporation, and the Cumberland Road Corporation owned the Cumberland Road, and, uh, I don't know, Elm Street was owned by the Elm Street Association, well, then they would be competing with each other. And maybe some of them were better at stopping these things than others. Let's take speed, for example. Now, maybe it's speed that's doing it. But maybe it's the variance or the standard deviation of speed. You know, I used to have a Honda 90cc motorcycle. Uh, it was capable downhill with a tailwind of doing 45 miles an hour. <laughs> Uphill with a passenger and a headwind, I could do maybe 35, but I'd get on the highway. I'm talking a highway where the speed limit is 70 miles an hour, but the minimum speed is 40, and I could sort of make 40. And you know that if you do 70 on a highway that says 70, people go by you like that. <laughs> So the variation in speed is somewhere between 40 and 80. Maybe that is too much. Maybe that's the cause of it. We don't know. We'll never know because, as Uncle Mao said, you don't have a thousand flowers blooming. 
You don't have different entrepreneurs doing different things as they do in the automobile or the chair industry or the shoe industry and some of them, their plans fail and they go broke and others succeed and they make money and can expand their base of operations. You don't, you don't have any of that. All you have is a made in Washington DC policy of whatever it is, the double nickel or now it's 70. In other words, there's no experimentation about how to reduce debts. The Washington DC, Obama now or whoever he appoints uh, to the NHTSA will well, look, these rules don't come down to us on stone tablets. The, we have to discover them. Markets are the mechanism par excellence for discovering how best to reduce debts. Look, here's a, a possibility. Suppose I had a road and I had three lanes. Instead of a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 70, suppose I said, well, everyone has to do 55 here, they have to do 70 here, and they have to do 85 there. Would that be better? I don't know. Maybe. All I'm saying is that if we had a system, a competitive system, which we trust for good quality and low prices in every other realm of endeavor, if we had a system like that, we'd find out. When I wrote about this, and I'm coming out with a book on it soon, I came up with all sorts of other schemes beside that that might or might not work. Some of them, the government sort of follows, but not really fully. For example, one of my ideas was to make a cross, or a Jewish star, or a Muslim thing, or whatever. Whenever there was a death on the highway, you put one there. And that'll sort of scare people. Do I know that that would work? No, I'm not a road manager. I don't know. I'm just speculating. I'm, I'm trying to infer from what I know about private markets to this public market and saying, well, here's the sort of things that they could be doing. I had in mind real big ones. Nowadays they do it, but they're only about this big. I had in mind 20-foot crosses or Jewish stars or whatever. Another one, you know those cars where you know a truck hits them from one end and uh, hits them from the other end, and now the truck and, and the car, instead of being 20 feet long, it's five feet long, sort of accordionized. Put that up on a pedestal, right where the accident occurred. Will that stop? I don't know. But if I try it on the Walter Block Road and it doesn't work, I'll I'll lose money. I'll go broke, and maybe someone else will try something else. And what I'm saying is that from this sort of a system of buying and selling through the voluntary um, buy, uh, purchase of rights to go on different highways, we'll get better highways. We'll deal better with these, with these problems. Maybe what we ought to do the next time we catch someone who's uh, drunk driving, I think it was uh, Charles Barkley recently in the news, maybe we do something more serious to him than what was done to him. I don't know. Maybe the death penalty. I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, look, one guy gets executed for doing this stuff, may, maybe save hundreds of lives. I don't know. But the point is that if I announce this in advance and on my road you get caught drunk and driving, we're going to, you know, take a bite out of you, a serious bite. Maybe it'll help. I don't know. All I do know is that this is an impossibility. We, our system doesn't allow for this sort of experimentation, so we're never going to really solve this, this death problem. The second reason that I was getting into private roads is I used to live in New York City, and the traffic jams there, you wouldn't believe. Even in little towns or moderate cities like Knoxville, the, the traffic congestion is horrendous. Why is that? Well, in economics, we have this thing called supply and demand, quantity and price. What price do they charge for highway use during rush hour? Or rather, what additional price do they charge in for a highway use during rush hour that they don't charge uh, for driving at 3 in the morning? And the answer is zero. Right? I mean, they don't make you pay more when you drive at 5 o'clock. Well, at zero, the demand is much greater than the supply, and that's traffic congestion, excess demand. What's the economic answer? Well, get the price a little higher. Charge a little bit more. In other words, if what you do is you... You have a time, this is time, and this is quantity of people in the highway. Well, uh, let's say this is midnight, 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. 
Uh, low traffic. Now we get to 7, 7 a.m. to 9. High traffic. This is the rush hour. Then it goes down a little lower, although in New York it's up there at all hours. And then, uh, let's say, uh, 6 to 8 at night, another rush hour. Namely, what you do, what the price system naturally does is if you charge more during the rush hour, you decrease the amount of usage. If you charge less during the non-rush hours, you increase. In other words, you sort of even this out. That's what hotels do. They charge more during the season than in the non-season. I mean, if it's a skiing hotel, they charge more for the rooms during the winter than the summer. And if it's a beach one, they do the opposite. In other words, they flatten it out. Everyone following me on this? Yes? Just common sense. Um, they do that for certain holidays with restaurants, whatever. But what the, what the stupid government does, and that's a redundancy. That was a joke. It didn't work too well. But look, when an economist tells a joke, it's sort of like a bear plays the violin while riding a unicycle. You don't ask, was he in tune? You say, wow, a bear <laughs> riding a unicycle and playing the violin. What do you do? So when an economist tells a joke, you don't say, well, was it funny or not? You say, wow, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> in any case, what, what these rascals do in government is they, they do anti-peak load pricing. Namely, they exacerbate the congestion. The, the idea is when you buy those <laughs> trip tickets, the, you know, they'll give you a month trip, a month ticket, right, to get through those uh, toll boots. It's a little cheaper per trip than if you were to buy one each time. Well, who uses those monthly tickets? People who ride during the uh, peaks or during the troughs? Obviously, during the peaks. Those are the people that go to work 9 to 5. So what they do is they charge less, so that increases this a little bit. Namely, they're exacerbating the, the variances. And then they give us all these whining things, well, carpool, use a bus, and you know all that crap. If they raised the prices enough, the market would see to it that we did that. That's the beauty of the market, the magic of the marketplace. But if you don't have markets, if you just have government edicts, it doesn't work. Okay, those are the two reasons. Now what I'm going to do is give objections to my wonderful theory. The first objection is, oh, by the way, I should say that this sounds a little weird. You know, what's block, uh, on what drug, what controlled substance am I on to be saying such weird things? Well, you know how the first roads were? The first roads were turnpike roads. My research goes back to the 8th century in England. The first roads there were private. The first roads here in North America, in, in the US, were turnpike roads. Only what happened is that the government refused to uphold the, the law, namely the, there were people who were um, told busters or they would run around the toll and they wouldn't pay. And when they called upon the police to support them, they wouldn't. So the thing isn't viable if the government doesn't uphold property rights. So it didn't work. Uh, in New York City, the uh, BMT and the IRT were private, private uh, subways. And they were charging a nickel and they were going to raise it to a dime. And the government of the day said, oh, this is unconscionable, greed, whatever. So they nationalized it, or in this case, municipalized it. What year? I don't remember. 30 somewhere. I, I've got it in my book, but I, I just don't remember things like that. And then what? guess what they did? <laughs> they raised it to a dime, so go figure. But, but the, the whole point was that, that these, just because they are long, thin things, it doesn't mean they can't be privatized. Okay, now let me give some objections to this. Uh, the first one is the trap. Here you are on this road, and there's your little house, and I'll put the little smiley face to indicate that you're a happy person. And now you want to get out on the road, and they say, oh, that'll be a million dollars each trip. <laughs> Namely, you have this idea, well, if you have private roads, they'll trap you there. Well, this is silly. Uh, right now, if you buy a house, uh, you have to do title insurance. Then we make sure that the guy who's selling you the house is the owner of the house. Well, you'd have a new thing called access insurance. Namely, you're not buying a house until you tie up 
uh, contractually the owner of the road uh, and say, well, you know, what's the deal here? Uh, can you raise, uh, can you triple the, the access price in, by your whim? In which case I'm not buying the house in the first place. The economics of it is that if I have a road on an empty path somewhere, I want to encourage people to move in so that I'll have more customers, more traffic, whatever. I can charge more people more money. So I'll encourage them. And one way to encourage them is to tie myself up contractually to make sure that I can, um, uh, can't be arbitrary and capricious and you know, sort of trap them in the house. And the idea is you have to be a, either a good pole vaulter or you have to have a helicopter or something. No. Uh, the, the law system will take care of that problem. Uh, another one is eminent domain. They say, well, Block, you're, you're such a big supporter of um, private property. Well, you can't have long, thin things without eminent domain because, you know, if I want to build a, uh, a road from uh, Knoxville to New York City, how many people's property will I have to go through to get a new road going there? I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 different people would own land in that way, right? And then you have the problem of the holdout. Some guy over here says, sure, I'll sell you my land for $6 trillion. Well, there are ways, we have our vase. That was another joke. <laughs> uh, one way is you can go around them. You don't have to. Uh, yes, the, the shortest distance between the two points is a straight line, but what the heck? You can go the great circle route. You, if you have someone like that, you can uh, go around them. Another thing that you could do, suppose he owns land like that, and he's very obstructive. Well, you can go under it or go over it. Namely, this doctrine of, what, what do they call it, uh, where you can't uh, add colon? The ad colon doctrine says that if, here's the earth, if you own a square mile of the earth, you own a, uh, what do you call it, a pyramid or a, a cone down to the center of the earth and then up into the heavens. See, the ad colon doctrine would say you, you can't do that. You can't go under him or over him because he owns down below to the core of the earth and up into the heavens. Well, the Ad Colum Doctrine is not compatible with libertarianism. Libertarianism is based on the John Locke and Murray Rothbardian homesteading theory. You didn't homestead anything 5,000 miles down in the core of the earth. You didn't homestead anything 50,000 feet above. If you had the Ad Colum Doctrine, you couldn't have airplanes. Every time somebody went over your house, you'd say, ah, oh, that'll be a, a quarter or 20 bucks or whatever. And the air flight would be <coughs> precluded. What other objections are there? Well, I think I've gone on for about a half hour. I must, in my writings, I must consider maybe 20, 25 objections. I, I don't want to take any more time. Let me just summarize. If it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Everything moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. And you get brownie points on ethics. Because when things are private, we deal with each other in a civilized, non-barbaric way. I can't take Melissa's backpack without her permission. That's what the market is. And when we have things in the public sector, we ride roughshod over each other. We treat each other like animals. We treat each other like barbarians. It's not legitimate. And also, it's not efficient. Now, I don't know how many deaths there would be if all the roads were private. My speculation... It'd take too long to get into why there'd be about uh, 8,000 deaths based on weird things. There'd still be some deaths. I mean, when people go 70 miles an hour, there'd be some deaths, but uh, the death rate would be vastly reduced and the um, congestion would be not eliminated, but greatly reduced. And that's my case for privatizing roads. Well, thank you.